Antoine, Adrian, thank you so much for joining me. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at some recent ancient coin wins. I'll be sharing some Byzantine trachea. I think Antoine's got a great variety of Greek and Roman, and Adrian has got some late Roman Republican coins to share. How are you all doing on this fine Saturday morning, and I guess maybe for you all evening? Right, I'm doing great. Hey, Sam, it's great to be here. Yeah, doing pretty well. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing awesome. It's game day here on campus. we got a huge football game coming up, so... Once I'm done with this, I'll be, uh, we can just say getting ready for that. I'm looking forward to it. Biggest game of the season, possibly biggest game in a couple of years. Oh, exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. yeah it's yeah. definitely fall season, but also even more exciting. We got some cool coins to share. So uh, I thought I'd go through some of mine here. I've got some ancient Byzantine coins that I won via some individually and some in group lots. I thought maybe we can get started there and just take a quick look at these. Uh, so first up, I've got a silver trachea of John III Vitazzi's. He is one of the better known late Byzantine emperors. So he was uh, later canonized after his reign and just known for being philanthropic, built a lot of hospitals, invested a lot in his empire. And so kind of ruling in the post-1204 sack, he did a lot to sort of rejuvenate the empire and bring back uh, prosperity to the empire. And so this coin is very interesting because if you look at the Christ next to him, it's actually not... Uh, a normal depiction of Christ, but this is Christ Chalcides or Christ of the Chalk Gate. I don't know if you all are very familiar with iconoclastic history, but the Chalk Gate icon of Christ was the icon that when it got taken down off the gates, um, started the whole iconoclast controversy around the 700s. And that's sort of the, the famous conflict in Byzantium where uh, people argued, are icons breaking the second commandment or are they uh, an object worthy of veneration? Are they fine to be used in liturgical practices? And so that icon actually started that whole issue and its removal started the conflict and sort of it being put back up in place in the 800s by the wife of the emperor Theophilus that ended the conflict permanently and let the iconophiles, the lover of icons, win. And so it's very unusual that John III Vitazzi would use specifically Christ of the Chalk Gate, Christ of the Chalk Gate icon on a coin almost 400 years after that conflict. And it brings up a lot of questions of legitimacy in the post-1204 Byzantine Empire and sort of wondering if perhaps that icon had taken on a special cult of its own, cult's the wrong word, a special veneration, a special following of its own, and that perhaps John was alluding to that in this context, and that the fact that he doesn't have control of Constantinople, that's under the Venetians, under the Latins, but maybe he still had this icon in exile, and so he was using this icon to portray his legitimacy. And uh, it's a very rare issue, and I got this in a group lot of all places, so I'm very happy to have it, and you can see it's got some major problems, but I've only been able to find one other example sold in the last 20 years. So it's one of those types where I think even though it has a huge gash and is broken, I'm very happy to have it. First off, I got to say, I, I get super anxious looking at this. Uh, how is it like having to, like, are, are, are you needing to be very um, careful when you're handling it? Or no, it's, it's, it's actually like pretty stable? solid. Like that yeah. actual last chunk, it's a decently thick coin. So yeah, I don't have too many worries about it. Uh, is there anything in particular about the obverse that you'd like to, to go over? Yeah, so I kind of touched on that uh, aspect of Christ with the icon. I thought that was very interesting that the emperor is uh, putting its legitimacy through a special version of Christ, this uh, sp sp specific icon. I just thought that was very interesting. You don't see that very often on Byzantine coins. Uh, but yeah, it's a, overall a decent win. Pretty rare. I was happy with that. And I've kind of got a group photo here of just some recent Byzantine wins where you can kind of see uh, different types of Byzantine silver. So top left, you can see the coin I just shared. Uh, top right, you've got an unpublished Tornesi. I'll be getting into that a bit more later with some photos. Bottom left, you've got a Basilicon of Andronicus III. And then pretty special bottom right, you've got a silver trachea of Michael VIII and Andronicus II. That's a coronation issue. Uh, very rare, which kind of presents the crowning of Michael VIII, the uh, Byzantine emperor who retook Constantinople in exile. It's the recrowning of him or, and his son as well, elevating him to the co-emperorship. You can see they're both being crowned together by the emperor or by the archang archangel Michael. Uh, and that's the, kind of the namesake of the emperor Michael. But it's a, a pretty neat issue. So these are some of the recent ones I've had. Uh, one other photo, I've got the reverse here if it'll load. You can kind of see on that the reverse is St. George, I believe, in the bottom right for that Michael VIII and Andronicus II issue. The Basilicon is Christ on the obverse. The Ternese, you've got St. Michael in the top right. And top left, you've got the Virgin Mary. 
Uh, and you can tell on that trachea I shared of John III Vitazzi's, it's got a very nice style. You can see it's a very large issue as well. This is speculated to be a coronation issue due to the very fine style. You can see, even though mine has got some issues, the artistry is very well executed and the dyes, they're finely engraved and also of a large diameter, so it's suspected that these were presentation pieces used at his coronation or soon thereafter. That's very interesting. Those are some nice looking coins. Yeah, some have problems, but they're uh, mostly pretty rare. Like the top left trachea and the bottom right trachea, those are pretty much impossible to get. Like top left, I mean, if that ever came to auction, I couldn't afford it. I was super lucky that it was unidentified in a group lot and I picked it up. And then bottom right actually went up at auction with Roma this summer. And I was super lucky. I got the lowest hammer by far. I think there have been five examples sold in the last 20 years. And this was the cheapest, I guess due to the chip. But there have been some worse ones that sold for significantly more. So I was super happy to win that. I wasn't expecting it, but my low ball came through. So pretty thrilled to have it. Surprisingly good metal on, on the uh, lower right uh, coin. Uh, like yeah. Like lustrous names. Yeah. It's got some nice turning. With the metal, are these all supposed to be silver in the same way? Uh, no. Yeah, so I'll go back to the group photo real quick. The top left trachea and the bottom left are supposed to be pure silver. The um, bottom left coin, or sorry, the top top left, bottom right, those are two silver trachea, so you can see they're skiffate. Uh, those are supposed to be pure silver, if not two, two thirds silver, one third gold. By the time the bottom right coin was issued, it would have just been pure silver, but theoretically the top left coin would have also been somewhat gold. But it, it, it is pure, pure silver pretty much. And then the bottom left, the flat coin, that should be pure silver, and top right is a billion coin, so it's probably like 30% silver, 40% silver. You can kind of tell that's probably one of the, the darker ones. It's got some unusual surfaces, and that's due to the nature of not being entirely pure silver. I see, and was that more of a fun function of the economy of the empire at the time? Empire yeah, so just different denominations. it was supposed to be meant as a one-eighth small change for the coin you see on the bottom left. So it was kind of meant to be just um, an easy way to transact, um, just kind of a change for economic transactions. So that's why it wasn't pure silver. It was just supposed to be like small change. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll go through here real quick. So this is that unpublished Tronese. So there was one other example sold by C&G. I got this from, I believe, Biga Numismatics on Bitter. Uh, <laughs> there was a whole odyssey behind getting this, but I won't go into that. I don't know if you remember that, Adrian, the whole story where this wasn't getting shipped out to me and the seller basically was blackmailing. Uh, <laughs> But I, 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 yeah, I eventually, I, I'll go into it. I guess I brought it up. Yeah, so I bought this coin and the seller sent me an empty envelope and then refused to sell him, send me the coin. I had to kind of go through weeks of emailing and hassling to finally get him to send me this. And I wasn't sure if I was being kind of stuck up because the guy had realized what he had. Um, but eventually I got the coin for the price I paid, so I was happy about that. But yeah, it's an unpublished Renese. There was one sold by C&G in 2003, but since then, that's the only other example I can find. It's not in any of the references. And I'm actually working on an article right now that's going to reestablish the chronology of the late Byzantine mints and looking at when the silver trachea stopped and the Trinese and Basilicon came in. And actually, this is tied through the style to different um, AE trachea issues. So I think I can actually use this piece in my paper as evidence for the time period when these got introduced. But it's a very interesting coin. It doesn't look like much. So to the non-Byzantine collector, the late Byzantine collector, it probably doesn't look like anything. But uh, it's a very interesting issue. You've got co-emperors Andronicus II and Michael IX on the reverse, and then you've got St. Michael, like I said, on the obverse. But yeah, it's a very interesting issue, unpublished, and I'm hoping to use that as evidence in my argument when I reestablish the late Byzantine mint chronology. Good stuff, and good luck on your article. It sounds very interesting. Thanks, yeah, I'm hoping to shake up the industry with it. Uh, but I think I've got some good points. I'm looking forward to that coming out. But I think it's going to be a while. It's kind of a, a longer article. And with something like that, you've got to make sure you get everything right. Sure, yeah. But yeah, those are pretty much all my wins I had to share. Um, oh, I had one more. Uh, so this is a rare Byzantine Civil War coin, a Politicon type. These, no one actually knows who issued them. And the reverse says Politicon um, in Greek or translated of the people. And it's unsure who issued these or why. It's thought that maybe they were Latin quarters in Constantinople who were issuing these from the people because they've got a very Latin style. If you look here, the obverse has got three keys. That's perhaps an allusion to 
um, papal iconography. Um, just kind of thinking about that, it's a very unusual design, not seen on Byzantine coins ever outside of this. Uh, and the entire series has got um, extreme Latin influence, so it's not known why or who issued these, but they're very interesting. And this is a very rare type that I got pretty cheap due to the nature of it being damaged. If you look, it's actually broken and been repaired. So it's not the best example, but I was the underbidder on one, or underbidder to the underbidder on one a while back that sold for, I think, 800 francs. So I really couldn't afford the rest, so I was happy to get a budget example like this in my collection. Then I've kind of got some group photos here of some different Politicon coins. I couldn't even notice that it was uh, repaired um, before you uh, before you mentioned it. Yeah, if you um, if you look at the reverse here, you can kind of see that silver gash going throughout. That's actually yeah, what's been yeah, repaired yeah. and fixed. But it's it's been done pretty well to be. I mean, you can see it more in the reverse, but on the obverse you can't tell, which is nice. And I actually think the the uh, iconography used here is actually like pretty appealing. Uh, it's it seems to be pretty unusual, or am I? No, you're right there. Yeah. yeah. If you look at this group shot, it's got uh, very Latin influences. Um, so the bottom two coins are kind of stereotypical Byzantine. You've got the emperor on the left with the saint on the right, or vice versa. Uh, but the top coins you see is um, the one on the top left and top right. It's actually a castle, a castle with two stars and a crescent moon on top, and the one in the middle is keys. These are very Latin, Latinized designs, so it's unusual to see them on Byzantine coins. And when you go to the reverse, you can see it's also, once again, uh, having Latin influence, the top left and top right. They've got a cross, which you don't often see on Byzantine coins until Latin influences change Byzantine style. That cross pate with symbols inside, it's a very Latin style. And same with the, the bottom design here, where you would have like the Virgin Mary and a circular legend all around. You can just see how the style is very Latin, so it's unsure of who minted these. It's thought, if you notice, the top three are flat and the bottom two are skiffate. It's thought that the skiffate ones were perhaps issued by the Byzantine mint authorities and the flat ones were issued by Western peoples inside the Byzantine Empire for whatever reason. Perhaps trade. It's also been speculated these were functioning like bread tokens, some sort of non-actual non currency, but a, a sort of tradable disc that you could use in the city for a certain purpose. And that perhaps the legend politicon of the people clues into that. Perhaps it somehow worked with the bread dole or a civic function, but yeah, they're a pretty big mystery, and I don't think we're ever going to know who issued them or why. Very interesting. But yeah, those have been my recent wins. I've been uh, pretty lucky here. I got a lot of special coins, and a lot of them very cheap too, so I was happy to get those and sort of build the collection up one coin at a time. But yeah, that concludes my recent wins, and I think we're going to be going into Anto or no, Zadie's coins, or uh, Adrian's coins next. Uh, yeah, um... Obviously, I'm not uh, <laughs> as uh, good of a speaker uh, that you guys are, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, You've got the accent, have... though, so you can you can <laughs> woo us with that. <laughs> yeah, I can I can uh, I can make some excuses. Uh, no, but um, I have three coins that I've recently bought, uh, and um, I've during this year I've I've really tried to to limit myself in my in my buying, trying to. To, to limit myself at least to, to Roman Republican. Um, so this obviously um, is a portrait denarius of um, uh, Lepidus and Octavian. Uh, this is a coin that uh, is not very rare, uh, but uh, it, it often comes very crude. Uh, so as it often, often is with, uh, with military mint coins, is that um, they were struck in haste. Uh, so you have a lot of like off-centered strikes. You have a lot of die wear uh, that accumulates over time. Uh, but uh, to me, this coin uh, was just enough that I would be uh, uh, happy with it. Uh, obviously, the the legends are uh, are legible. Um, the busts, though, uh, they're a bit flat. Um, but I think uh, th this might just be on the on the edge of what I would consider acceptable, uh, and I'm I'm actually like really really pleased uh, having acquired this. Um, I thought I'd uh, go over just briefly uh, the the career uh, of of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. Uh, I think most people listening to this uh, are probably very uh, familiar with uh, that of Octavian's career. Um, since that, that's something that we all read uh, every day. Um, Lepidus, though, um, some people might not be as uh, familiar with him. 
Um, so, uh, Lepidus, um, being uh, a, a, a Roman patrician, uh, uh, early, on, early on in his political career, uh, served as uh, Triumvir Munitalis, uh, being one of the three uh, um, uh, moneyers of the Roman Republic in 61 BC. Uh, he struck a variety of coins, uh, highlighting the accomplishments of his family. Uh, and these are uh, pretty sought after today. Uh, they're not very, very rare, but uh, they usually uh, rack up a, a decent hammer, even in uh, fine to, to VF grade. Uh, later on, uh, Lepidus would go on to serve as a loyal Caesarian in the Senate. Uh, and just uh, after the, the civil war started, he was actually elected to the, to the position of Praetor. Uh, as Caesar uh, left uh, it, Italy to, to chase after Pompey, he actually left Rome uh, in Lepidus's hands, which is a, a sign, I think, uh, of how, how much trust uh, this man uh, had for from from his uh, his commander Caesar. Uh, after 40, 49, uh, Lepidus was given the the command of uh, the Hispania Citerior uh, as a proprietor. Uh, during his term, he was um, embroiled in a in a dispute in a neighboring province in which he. Uh, managed to diplomatically and and through like very um uh through through very like uh, how do you call it um through diplomat diplo diplomacy and uh and uh skillful uh tactics he was able to to um quell a, a smaller rebellion in the province um thus making him even more uh, respected in the eyes of caesar at the same time in Rome, uh, Mark Anthony was uh, busy uh, uh, cocking it up. <laughs> he was uh, making a mess of things, uh, having quarrels with the Senate, uh, promoting civil violence. Uh, as Caesar returned from his Egyptian campaign, uh, he was uh, he was looking to make a difference, uh, uh, make a change of management in Rome, and thus appointed Lepidus as consul in 46. I'll skip just to, to to not sit here and talk for hours. I'll skip over the the Ides for now, uh, and just speak briefly on the uh, post Ides career of Lepidus. Uh, after Caesar's assassination, uh, he uh, he served as a partisan of Antony uh, in the war against the Senate and Octavian. Uh, after a brief pitched uh, fight at Mutina. Uh, uh, there were talks with uh, Octavian, and finally a reconciliation was made between the the three men, uh, Lepidus, Anthony, and Octavian. Uh, this is where we come to the to the events surrounding this specific coin. Uh, it was struck to commemorate the the foundation of the Second Triumvirate, uh, a legal organization made uh, to establish uh, dictatorial powers for these three men um, they uh, they did it a little differently than their predecessors uh, in the first triumvirate uh, they decided to make this power grab a legal function of the Roman state to punish Caesar's assassinate uh, assassin uh, assassinators um, so that's the that's the history regarding the the, the context of this specific coin um, yeah thanks so much that was a great summary <laughs> well Thanks. done. I, I, I tried to do my best with the uh, my my limited vocabulary. So I've, uh, I've got but... a quick question here, if you don't mind. So you yeah. see, I don't know if this is just uh, convention or what, but you've got Lepidus here on the obverse and Octavian on the reverse. Is there actually any significance in that ordering here on the coin, or is that just the auction house choosing to put that side first? Uh, so yeah, uh, you're right. It, uh, Lepidus is on the obverse, and. There are some interesting uh, speculations to be made about the actual uh, political structure of the Second Triumvirate. Uh, many historians consider Octavian to be a, a, a junior member of this pact, uh, with Lepidus and Antony actually holding uh, the majority of the uh, of the power uh, in the pact. 
Um, so the positioning of the uh, of Lepidus's portrait on the obverse could definitely be a power thing, uh, but we don't have any solid uh, documentation to that fact. It's just speculation. Cool. Uh, before moving on, I, I just thought I'd uh, go over the legends briefly because they also tell a pretty interesting tale. Um, on the obverse here, we can obviously see the the, the name of of, uh, of Lepidus, followed by um, the title Pont Max, uh, meaning Pontifex Maximus. Uh, Lepidus was actually given uh, this title after Caesar's death, uh, which also hints at the the um, incredible ambition and. Uh, uh, prospect of, of Lepidus uh, right after the uh, assassination of Caesar uh, as being a possible successor to the man himself. Um, after that, we can see the, the legends uh, uh, Tres Viri Republicae Constituendae. Uh, I probably butcher that, but uh, it, it means three men for the restoration of the Republic, uh, which was the legal name for this uh, this uh, triumvirate uh, that they established. Uh, on the reverse, we can see the um, uh, portrait of Octavian uh, with the legends uh, Caesar Imp uh, and then Tres Viri Republicae Constituendae. Uh, Octavian stylized himself after his adoption by Caesar as a new Julius Caesar. Uh, so his coins do not actually bear uh, his uh, the name he was born with, but rather the uh, adoptive name that he got from his uh, adoptive father. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's this coin. Uh, enough rambling about it, uh, but I, I really really like it. Uh, a, le a portrait of Le uh, of Lepidus. This is the only type that bears one. So having one in my collection is. Uh, uh really really uh, something that i'm uh, i'm thrilled for and i think i mean you still got a lot of expression in lepidus's portrait here around the eye too I, I think you can actually really tell the man behind the coin in some sense you've got a lot of artistry left where i feel like kind of like the very the most important part of the coin is still present here yeah yeah exactly i agree um so yeah my second coin is another republican denarius uh, this one, however, um, is uh, from a bit uh, earlier in the, 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 the Republican time period. Uh, this is a coin of an ancestor of Julius Caesar, actually, uh, issued by, by the, the moneyer Sextus Julius Caesar in 129 BC. Um, as is the case with many middling Republican politicians, we don't really know a lot about this individual. Uh, but he is mentioned offhand uh, a few times by uh, by Cicero uh, as someone who um, uh, followed legal statutes uh, and seems to have been a a, uh, uh, a a legal practitioner more so than than his uh, his uh, ancestor uh, uh, Julius Caesar. Um, Sextus served as urban praetor in 123 BC, uh, and that seems to have been the culmination of his political career, as there are no other mentions uh, of him holding political office uh, after the, that point. Uh, the reverse uh, is a very standard uh, uh, Julian uh, theme. Uh, it, it shows Venus, birth giver. Um, on a biga being crowned by a, a cupid. Uh, the cupid is a little off plan, as you can see here, but um, uh, this is a very standard scene uh, that alludes to the to the Julian myth of having been uh, uh, having been uh, um, uh, having had ancestry to to Venus uh, in the uh, uh, in the earlier histories of the Republic. So uh, sorry, my, my neighbors yeah, are being sorry. a bit loud right now, so I muted myself real quick. But I've got a question with the spelling here. It's not the normal Caesar variant. Reminds me of the German Kaiser. I'm take the C away and add the K. Uh, but is there a reason why this is spelt uh, in the way that that the, uh, it is here on the coin and not the traditional Caesar with the A-E but the A-I? 
there is definitely a reason. Uh, I'm not actually sure why, but I know that there are other uh, instances on coins in which uh, Caesar is spelled this way. Um, I've tried looking it up and, and talking with some of my uh, uh, more um, knowledgeable friends in, in Latin, but I, I haven't really gotten a good explanation as to why yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm currently uh, looking into it, so yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, going to my third coin here, my third and final coin, uh, this is something a bit uh, divergent from uh, obviously the denarii that we've been looking at um, uh, up until now. This is a, a Sistafor that I think most people would, would recognize and uh, find uh, pretty boring. Uh, you've got the Sista Mystic on the obverse and the uh, snakes entwined on a, on, a, on a bow case on the reverse, very standard. Uh, however, uh, this coin belongs to a very rare series of uh, Sistafori minted in the city of, of Nysa. Um, anyone who collects provincial coins would probably recognize this city as they, they produced uh, provincial coins for, for over 250 years. But this represents one of the last silver coins ever produced in this uh, Greek city uh, in Lydia, uh, Nisa. Um, I've been meaning to to expand uh, slightly uh, uh, into what I call the off-brand Sistafori mints. Um, these are mints that produced uh, Sistafori uh, in very rare, very small emissions. Uh, and I, I think those are uh, pretty interesting as, as um, Sistafori goes. You've got to save uh, your money for when the Cicero comes. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll I'll just become a millionaire before, real quick. Uh, There's no, a reason but, why the lottery uh, exists, and that's for coin collectors. Just kidding. Exactly. Don't gamble. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, but um, so on the reverse here, uh, this is where pretty much all the action is. Uh, we can see the mint mark of the city of Nisa uh, here in the left field. Uh, above the snakes, uh, we see the name of the magistrate who issued this coin. He was probably named Antiochus. Uh, and in the, the right field here, we see the date of the coin. Uh, so this is the year 23 of the uh, Asian period, uh, Ephesian standard, probably. Uh, so this would have been uh, 60, 63 BC to 62 BC. And then finally, uh, in the right field, here's a cult statue of Persephone uh, to the right. Uh, so a very rare, a very interesting uh, coin that I recently picked up, and I'm uh, super happy about it. And that concludes my little presentation. Hey, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, some very interesting coins here. It's exciting to hear, too, that you're expanding what you're collecting here. I'm curious to see what else will be winning soon. Well, I guess one you want to take over? Yeah, sure. Well, very cool coins. Thank you, Adrian. Um, my first coin here sort of builds off of that strong Republican bent that we've been building so far. Um, See, so yeah, I guess we could actually go to the next tab over. Yeah, this definitely. This coin is a coin of the same Marcus Junius Brutus, as mentioned earlier in passing. Um, so yeah, this is the Brutus who, as we all know, went along and helped to murder Caesar, assassinate Caesar, and then he went on to fight against the Triumvirate. He was a key opponent of Lepidus and Marcus Antonius and Octavius. Um, but this is before all of that happened. This is before he would have known that that was going to happen. This is, it was still turbulent times, but this coin is thought to have been made around 54 or 55 BC. So that would have been a good 10 years before the assassination and the conspiracy all came about. Um, so on the obverse here, and I should note, at the time, Brutus was very much at the outset of his career. So he started on the Cursus Honorum, or sort of the political ladder, literally like a ladder going up of political offices. He started in one of the lower bottom offices, which there were about, I think the number is 26, but there, it, I could be wrong on that. But one of the groups of offices was the Triumviri, which is three men, for 
Trio Muri Monetales. So that would have been the three men in charge. The name is a bit longer than that, but it's the three men in charge of the production and this and that of coinage. That was the official title. So he starts off at the bottom of the ladder here as a moneyer. So that's obviously a boon for us collectors. Um, and it's interesting <clears throat> because there's there are two main types known from this period for Brutus. And they both sort of allude to what would transpire later in 10 years. They give a strong sense of the man and what he might have felt. So this one, it says, obviously, as we can see there, libertas in Latin, which means liberty, the concept of liberty, but also in this case, the literal personification of liberty as a goddess on the obverse. So, you know, freedom, just like Lady Liberty on, I think, a, quite a few American coins. It's very, very similar. Um, and then on the reverse, yeah, if we go to the other side. Yes. Uh, just the, yeah, thank you. So now here we get an interesting scene. We get a scene from what would have played out in daily life in Rome from the earliest days of the Republic all the way down to the ending of the Empire. We see a consul, and it's generally thought to be um, Lucius Brutus, who was um, this Marcus Brutus's ancestor, the man who helped found the Republic. You know, he drove out the tyrants and he avenged, you know, um, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember, but the, it mirrors the rape of, um, yeah, anyways, it doesn't matter. Uh, but yeah, he got rid of Tarquinus Superbus, set up the Republic, and he was one of the first two consuls elected, Lucius Brutus. And he was, you know, a staunch Republican and he defended liberty and he defended the... I guess not constitution, but the, the founding principles of the new Roman Republic, which was mythically or semi-historically thought to have been founded in 509 BC, um, to the point of even flogging and potentially sentencing to death, executing one of his own sons for treason or attempted treason. Um, but yeah, so he was a consul and in the middle here, we have a consular procession. So we have the third figure over from the left, the tallest figure there, that is the consul himself. He's not carrying anything. He has his arm outstretched in a, you know, the classic Romans are very verbose with their hands. Quite a few gesticulations going on there in daily life. So he's got his arm out ready to begin orating. And then the two men flanking him on either side of in front of and behind of him are lictors. And so these would have been, they were paid by the state. They weren't, they weren't soldiers, but they were like soldiers. They were a form of bodyguard that um, at times also it initially was composed of the lower ranking plebeian men in society, but later it came to be um, higher ranking men as well as retired um, centurions. They'd be given the opportunity to sign on as lictors after their time with the army, with the legions had been uh, come to an end, their contracts. So yeah, two lictors who would act as bodyguards. In this case, there's two depicted obviously because there's only so much space on a coin. In reality, a consul, there were different, it was it was an, a rank thing, a hierarchical thing. So different stations, different uh, magistrate offices would be given a different ration, I guess, if you will, or amount, allowable amount of lictors. So the consul was the highest office in the land, two of them very important people, you don't want them dying. So they were given 12 lictors each. I believe this may have been reduced to six within the precincts of Rome itself. Um, and also the lictors, they were a sort of direct embodiment of the power of the consul, but also of just Roman magistrates in general. So yeah, the lower magistrates would be given six, sometimes eight, sometimes only two or one lictor, depending on the circumstances. And obviously you were allowed more lictors outside of Rome than you were inside. And your lictors were these fasces, that's the um, large sticks, I guess you could call them, the large rods with an axe blade about two thirds of the way up attached to it those are known as fasces and this is where we get the term fascist from they're a symbol of power so they're these rods a bundle of rods tied together and then fixed with an axe blade and these were a very direct and real um i suppose embodiment personification of the power that roman magistrates wielded because within rome you'd have to remove the axe blade but when you were outside the precinct of rome itself then the axe blade was reattached and these officers, these magistrates had the authority to instruct the lictors to pass capital punishment if 
they so chose, against, I don't believe you could do it against a citizen of Rome, but against anyone else in Roman territory, they had that kind of power. So it's just a very real and direct example. It's not just ceremonial, but a real and direct example of the power that they wielded. So those are the lictors. And then at the very front of the procession, the smallest figure there, that is the ascensus. So this would have been, I guess, similar to a modern day page or a scribe. So he would go around and basically do all the extra tasks, running around, guiding, helping, writing things down for the, um, the consul or whoever the magistrate was, but in this case, the consul. And that was a position that also evolved over time. So it used to be more of a manservant initially, and then it came to be more of a scribe in the later Republican years. Um, so that's the reverse here. And there is actually, it's a little bit very cut off actually on this example, but the bottom does say Brutus. And so that's sort of, we're not too sure which Brutus is being referred to, because on the other issue of Brutus, he has a portrait of the same man, Lucius Brutus. And then on the other side, the reverse, he has um, Gaius Servilius Ahala, who was another ancestor of his from his mother's side, who was also instrumental in saving the Republic in the 5th century, so a bit later, about 100 years later. Um, so this could be referring to the man here as Lucius Brutus, or it could simply be Brutus reiterating that this coin is coming from him, that he's the money you're in charge. But in either case, that is, that's this coin, yeah. Yeah, very iconic issue. Definitely, and and like uh, I've been I've been eyeing this specific type for a, for a long while, um, but I haven't really been able to pull the trigger yet. But I have to say that yours, uh, the facial details on the on the lictors on the console on the reavers here, is uh, fantastic. Yeah, it's so much details, like m minuscule. Yeah, thank you. It's not the nicest coin, and there's obviously issues in general, and especially with the obverse. But I bought this for the reverse. I feel like the faces really give the sense of life to the scene. Like the census looks small and young, and he's like unsure of himself. And the first, the, I should have mentioned this, the primus lictor would always be at the very start of the procession of lictors. So whether there were two or 10 or 12, the primus lictor would be the oldest, most, I guess, experienced, the best of the bunch. He would always walk at the start of the procession. And in this case, if you look at him, he's got this look of his shoulders are slightly arched, his neck is craned forward, He's he looks old, he looks like his face is sagging. So it really, it builds on that. Then you've got the younger consul and then another, the lictor at the back who looks to be a similar age to the consul. That's a really interesting depiction of the scene. It breathes life into the scene, in my opinion. Agreed. The die cutter did a good job. Definitely, I agree. Well, cool, we can go ahead and move on to your next win. Yep, so this one is um, entirely different setting now, and it's far removed, about 1400 years removed from the last coin, and on the other side of the world. So this one comes to us from Delhi, or I guess New Delhi these days, similar area. Um, and this is from the Delhi Sultanate. This is from the middle years of the Delhi Sultanate, and one of its, um, I guess, most iconic, greatest, but also most infamous kings. So his name was Muhammad bin Tughluq. And he was part of this, um, this very, I guess, in the history of the subcontinent, it's a very iconic name because their dynasty transformed the Delhi Sultanate and it laid the groundwork for the later rise and expansion and eventual domination of the entire region by the Mughals. But at the same time, this ruler in particular, it was a lot of the work was done under him. But at the same time, he was a very strange and I guess unfortunate character in history because he's got these aspects of brilliance of genius these tolerant laws and he like he's a scholar and he's a poet and he is tolerant of religious freedoms and expression of different political beliefs and then at the same time he's this contradictory man who has an incredibly cruel dark side to him at the same time and he he slaughters entire cities. At one point, he depopulates the entirety of Delhi to move the capital to another place. And then he's sort of like, eh, nah, let's go back, right? Like he will just, he messes with the lives of hundreds of thousands of people just on the, the flip of a dime. He switches his mind and he 
changes the lives of hundreds of thousands, usually for the worse, but also in other ways for the better. Um, he sends up this disastrous expedition up into the northern the Himalayas, and then they never come back because the the hill tribes basically kill them all. And he doesn't, you know, he runs away and that's it. But at the same time, he expands his kingdom and he increases trade with the rest of the world. And he's he's a very interesting, enigmatic persona. So yeah, this is I've just um, a bit of an opportunistic pickup at the last CNG auction. Um, yeah. And if I recall correctly, doesn't this have a very heavy weight? Wasn't it about 13 grams? Ah, uh, yes. It's So this is to a different standard. It looks, you know, it's Islamic gold, but it's not the same as your standard um, dinar of the era. So this is made to an Indian standard, and I'm not sure exactly what the standard is. The weight is very similar to the modern measurement of the thola, which is around 11 grams. So that's what this coin weighs as well. Um, I think the denomination given for this is called the tanka but yeah it's 11 grams of gold and there were one of the interesting things that this king did monetarily was he had his gold coinage and he had silver coinage and then at one point he decided you know what would be a great idea i'm going to accept copper coinage these tankas of copper and i'm going to say that one copper coin is yep that's fine that's equivalent to a gold coin you can spend them the same way in the marketplaces by royal decree. <laughs> so obviously that went down about as well as you could expect. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's also well known for crashing the economy at one point and really, um, yeah. <laughs> That's a cool, cool coin, cool backstory. I'm always glad to see coins that aren't Greek or Roman. Not that there's anything wrong with Greek or Roman, but there's so many underdeveloped, under-collected fields out there that it's always exciting to see a new type like this. I think the other, the last point I want to make is this sort of shows a, a new era in the Islamic world. So this is one of the first coins that has the title Sultan written on it. The first king to take the title of Sultan was um, Muhammad of Ghazna. So that was around the year 1000 AD. So about 300 years before this guy. He was in um, basically modern Pakistan, Afghanistan, and he ended up conquering large parts of Iran as well. So he, like, how the Muslim world at the time was structured was there was the uh, Khalifa, who was, there was obviously first the Umayyads, then the Abbasid revolution, then there were the Fatimids at the same time as the Abbasids, and there was a bit of contention there, and there were other houses here and there. Um, but there would be the Khalifa, and they would be the de facto head of state of the entire, I guess, like the Muslim world, if you will. But then obviously they wouldn't be in charge of every single kingdom. There were dozens of kingdoms at times, like over a hundred different kingdoms that would nominally, some of them would nominally be client states of the Khalifa. But obviously in reality, many of them were more powerful than the Khalifa, sometimes much, much more powerful, especially as you got into the the Middle Ages, the era of the Crusades and onwards, from the 1100s onwards, you had the local kings were much, much more powerful, these sultans. So the title of sultan, sultan means power, it means authority and power in Arabic. So it's not, the king is saying that he's, you know, the person who claims the title of sultan is saying, look, I'm not the um, khalif, I'm not the representative of the prophet and the successor to him. Khalifa means successor, so I'm not the successor of the prophet as the leader of the Islamic world. No, no, I'd never do that. I, I, that's far too important to position for someone like me. All I am doing is taking authority to act on his behalf as a humble servant, uh, <laughs> as the leader of this kingdom, right? So we see on the reverse here, and obviously it's tough if you don't speak Arabic, but the start, the obverse starts off with the inscription, Durba fi zaman al Abdul Aji rahmatullah Muhammad bin. So that means struck in the during the era of the uh, the servant of Abdul Rahman and Muhammad. That's his name, and then that, that's of Muhammad bin Tughluq. And then the reverse says as Sultan as Sayyid as Shahid Tughluq Shah. So that's Sultan. So he's naming his father Muhammad bin as Sultan. So he's Muhammad, mm -hmm. son of the Sultan, um, the witness, the martyr, the look, Shah, which is another sort of title. 
Well, so I actually I did have a question on. Oh, sorry, I didn't yeah, mean to cut you off. This is the first coin that actually has that title there. Oh yeah, no, go for, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the Arabic. Actually, I was going to ask. Uh, the script seems very unusual to me, sort of different than what you normally see. Is this uh, like a local variation? I feel like I don't know. I mean, I'm not super familiar with Arabic to begin with, so perhaps I'm just uh, looking at nothing here or mi misreading it. But it does seem uh, like the yeah. script is more informal. I'm not sure. Is it a different calligraphy style that that's going on here? And with the dots yeah, too, I'm, I'm assuming those aren't part of the actual script. Is that just decoration? No, no, you've got a good eye there, that a good catch. So Arabic script, the earliest script that you see on a Mayyid coins, and I guess you also see it on the um, uh, Islamic Persian variant ones, the very early ones, that is Kufic script. So that is a very early form of Arabic where it's just the letter forms are just the empty shapes you get like uh like i guess the half square you see those little indentations right like if you look on the um reverse just yeah go over to the reverse a bit and you see like the three bumps like at the very top there's the long arm coming down and the three bumps or these bumps here right yeah like you follow that so there's the little indents there so kufic is just very basic it just has these these open shapes these bumps Right, those denote the form of the letters, but you have to know based on the context of the word what you're reading. Mm -hmm. So you have like, like for example, you have the letter S and SH, Sheen and Seen. They are both the exact same form in Kufic, like three lines going down, across, up, down, across, down, across, up, right? So you wouldn't know without context whether you're reading something that starts with an S sound for scene or a sh sound for sheen, for example. And the same goes with these closed dots for a, a Q and an F, right? Off and fe, and these other letters. So it's very context dependent. You have to know what you're reading. Whereas as Arabic spread outside of the Arabian Peninsula and eventually as far as India, it was obviously not the native tongue of a lot of people. There was a huge population that didn't wasn't even familiar with Arabic script. Um, Persian script was making a bit of a resurgence and it was it was very similar to Arabic, but obviously it had its own variations. So you get these different mushafs or scripture, script versions of Arabic popping up locally. And yeah, the, the dots actually are there to help someone who isn't a native Arabic speaker. So in this case, obviously it's made in India where most people weren't. So even literate people who could read Arabic usually needed these dots and lines as well. The lines, you'll notice there's some dashes and circles and everything. These denote the vowel sound. So they tell you, first of all, what letter it is. That's for starter. And they also tell you the vowel sound. Is it an open vowel sound? Is it an ah versus an e? Like, how do you, how do you read this properly? So that gives you all of that information. Whereas if you're going off the very early coins, you have to figure that all out yourself. You have to already know basically what you're reading, what the word is based on the context, based on already having memorized or heard that statement before, wherever it is. Whereas here, it's very like clearly laid out for you. So someone who isn't familiar with the script innately would be able to read it as long as they're literate, generally speaking. Very cool, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the great background there. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, Adrian, anything to add or should be, with, or sorry. With this coin, there's, um, <laughs> if you go to the next tab over, yeah. this is where provenance is an interesting thing. Um, so I, I was just interested in finding out more about this coin and when it was sold and where. So it was originally sold in Noble in I believe 2018 or so um, here in Australia. And so it was from the, collection of yeah dr vincent john adams flynn and i was like okay who is this guy let's look into him apparently he was from a wealthy family that um was involved in founding the major lottery companies here in australia um he was a some he was involved in politics lived in canberra all this stuff had a major collection of other furniture as well as coins other things and he was very interested in India, he'd frequently visit, and according to these articles, as well as an obituary that I read a little bit into, so he'd visit frequently, and he'd fund scholarships, I think, and quite a bit of stuff. He even wrote a book on, um, I think, the Mughal Emperor Akbar and one of his, like, alternative capitals, the short-lived alternative capital. Mm -hmm. I can't remember, yeah, the, the name of the book. 
but all of this stuff. Um, and then I got to the next tab, and obviously I'm not commenting on whether these are, this is true or not, but this is from the ABC, which is a very highly respected, it's like our national um, news agency here. So, yeah, I guess mm. it's interesting what you find when you search for provenance. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> provenance you don't want to find. Yeah, this was unfortunate. I should have stopped while I was ahead. <laughs> sort of reminds me of, who was that guy? The British actor, same kind of thing, where during his lifetime wasn't prosecuted, but afterwards a lot of uh, allegations oh, yeah, and claims who... came out. What's his name? I know who you were referring <sighs> that's, to, but it's I... It's going to bother yeah. me now. Yeah. Prince Andrew? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me just look uh, up. It was a really, really famous. It wasn't he a comedian or something? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you spell. That. Yeah. <laughs> Is that how you spell it? I don't know. Um, God, what was that guy's name? Um, sorry, that's gonna bother me now. I'm gonna look it up real quick. No, it's yeah, Jimmy Savile. There we go. I wonder yeah. if that's kind of similar. I mean, he was a very famous actor who did a lot of things and uh, had a lot of powerful connections and friends, and for that reason, pretty much wasn't prosecuted, even though. It was quite well known his activities, so I wonder if maybe that was the same case with uh, I forget his name, uh, Mr. Flynn. Yeah, look, I'm I'm not wanting to get into that. Too yeah. Much, but yeah, it's just it's interesting what you find. The wonders of yeah. provenance. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and they're 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 Don't think too like, deep. <laughs> coin collectors are uh, perhaps a scrupulous uh, bunch when you consider like there's. Um, uh, like Armstrong provenance, for example, could be uh, a bit controversial. Uh, I, think there I love are that. I would too. love to own an Armstrong coin. He's a legend. <laughs> yeah. That's actually, that's a good point. Like, to collect, a, like, maybe not a coin like this, the ones we're showing today, <clears throat> but to collect at a high level, the, like, real rarities and the really nice coins, you have to have a lot of money. And unscrupulous people tend to gravitate towards developing more wealth. Mm -hmm. over time because they don't care as much about morality and doing the right thing and oh should i be doing this to make my money obviously i'm not saying everyone with money or everyone wealthy is amoral or immoral but yeah it's just well, that's why we're now instituting a charity where anyone in our audience who has money should give it to us to get rid of that to get rid of that guilt and we'll buy coins and talk about it <laughs> we'll collect on your behalf exactly no i'm just joking but yeah i agree especially with armstrong i think he was doing tax fraud and investment fraud but i think he assembled arguably the best coin collection of all time antiquities too privately held i mean some very very it's interesting it's coins the best roman, roman yeah well, yeah with that yeah yeah that qualifier oh, and even if you go back into history many of these people that collected were they were you know robber barons and they were very wealthy aristocrats who made their wealth through questionable means and colonial activities and yeah it's a it's an interesting thing when you get into the history of it they but don't anyways, call it the hobby of kings really cool for nothing guys. let's talk <laughs> about the coins <laughs> yeah so we've got this coin next up yes so this is an interesting fusion of cultures here on this coin um so it's made in the middle hellenistic period really the, the height of the hellenistic in the second century bc or i guess the beginning of the end of the hellenistic depending on how you look at it um, this is made in Mindos, which if you look on the reverse, there is the legend quite clearly laid out there, Mindion. So the city of Mindos, which is in, I believe, Ionia, the Ionian coastline. It's not too far from Rhodes, uh, which is why the obverse portrait's also very, very similar to the portrait of um, Asclepius on the Rhodian tetrobles of the same era. Um, but there's a key difference here. It's not depicting a Greek deity, it's depicting a... Egyptian, or I guess a Greco-Egyptian deity. So the, on the obverse here, we have Serapis, um, who was a fusion of Osiris, who's the god of the dead in the underworld and being reborn in very, one of the very oldest and most important deities of um, Egyptian myth. I guess he's a mix of Hades and almost, um, I guess, Persephone, almost in a way. He's like this Persephone or Demeter both at once, like, the harvest and rebirth and the home but also death and the afterlife all of this stuff and the apis bull which i actually haven't read into the apis bull too much but i know it's quite important it was like a almost a manifestation i think perhaps of osiris there's a connection between the two um but yeah serapis started off as um 
Os Osiripus or something like that, something to that effect. And basically it was a fusion of Osiris with the Apis bull. And then because it was engineered or constructed by Ptolemy the first, he, you know, to appeal to Greek sensibilities instead of having the general depiction with an animal head or something um, like that, they chose to go a more classical Greek route with the depiction. So it was very much the the elegant bearded male depiction instead, sort of like Zeus or Poseidon that they chose. In this case, the coin looks very similar to the Rhodian tetrabols, which have um, Asclepius. So that's just a function of where it was made. But it's interesting because these cults, there were quite a few different rural, ruler cults. So, you know, deified rulers like Seleucus or Antiochus the first, Ptolemy as well, obviously, and all of the Ptolemaic pharaohs be inducted into that and into the pharaonic um, lineage, basically, of like god emperors after they die, all of that. But even across the rest of the, especially the Eastern Mediterranean world at the time, you'd have these cults that would form for different deities, for different rulers, for all sorts of different variations of the same deity locally. And one of them that became very popular was this Egyptian Egyptian fusion cult of Serapis with, I guess, a bit of fusion of Isis. And we're not talking about the terrorist organization, but the, the deity Isis, who is- Greetings all federal Egyptian agents. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify, because the name <laughs> in the modern era is unfortunately taken on a bit of a twisted meaning, but yeah. So she was she was more like I guess Demeter Persephone sort of at once. And she like revives Osiris, her husband, and gives birth to Horus, who is the god of the kings and the god of the sky and all of this. Um so on the reverse you see her crown, which was like it has these grain ears, it's got the snake in the center, it's got reeds from the reeds the marshes along the nile it's just this and then the bulls horns right there in the middle the bulls of the apis the horns of the apis bull um i i suppose that's what it's referring to so that's the crown of isis there so it's there was like this combined egyptian cults with serapis and isis being this new combo combination where previously the egyptians had had osiris and isis and then obviously it spread, it's here in Caria. And at the same time, there's a bit of politics as well, because if you look on the crown side at the bottom, there's a small little thunderbolt, which is the Ptolemaic thunderbolt. So obviously the Ptolemies had quite a bit of money and power, prestige, and they had they exerted their influence through that. So clearly this city had some sort of, I guess, working relationship, some sort of understanding with Ptolemaic Egypt, whether they were under direct control, nominal, you know, you'll protect us, whatever it was, there's obviously some aspect of Ptolemaic influence in Mindos at the time, which was in competition with Roman influence, Seleucid influence, Antigonid influence, all of that. So yeah, that basically sums this up. And obviously in the tradition of um, Greek autonomy of the city, we have a magistrate's name instead of a king, so it's Theodoros there on the other side of opposite from Mindion. So yeah, Theodore, the magistrate. Yeah, kind of a random, Super interesting random thing, question. Uh, oh shit, sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Um, super interesting. I, I haven't really uh, seen this uh, type of coin before, but I do recall seeing how uh, mythological uh, as like uh, mythological aspects are, are often fused into into Greek ones, uh, as with um, the coinage of Melita, modern day Malta, uh, where the iconography of Egyptian mythology mythology is often employed. So it, it's just super interesting to see see this here, the exact same thing on on, on a silver coin from an, an entirely different city. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because I think Melita actually has bronze coinage that features a bust of Isis. Yeah, that's a great point. So yeah, definitely there was a lot of syncretism and a lot of combining of different traditions. And I think you see something similar when you go even further east as well, with Persia and India adopting some Greek traditions as well. So yeah. I had a kind of a random question. Is this from Edgar Lowen with the background? <laughs> ah, yes it is, yeah. <laughs> Good catch. So I recently <laughs> purchased this and actually the next coin up as well, both from him. I had my Funny. eyes on them both for a while. 
Oh, awesome. Yeah, so I think this is probably a bit more up your alley. Definitely, I yeah. Don't know too much about this one. Is this Basil the Second and Constantine the Eighth? Yes, it is Constantine the Eighth and Basil the Second. Yeah. Beautiful. So, I mean, I just know that I love the portrait. It's Christ Pantocrator on the obverse, one of the key and most prolific icons of the Eastern Orthodox Church, I guess of Byzantium and also modern Orthodox states. And then it's the patriarchal cross between the two emperors. So I think they're father and son, right? Uh, brothers, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah, actually, in all honesty, I just love the portrait. The portrait on this one, the yeah, portrait of Christ on this is just amazing. I love the style of it. I love how the the sort of light double or all more like triple strike here gives that wavy halo effect there right behind the hair. I think it adds um, some depth really, too. Yeah, I feel like it, it almost feels yeah. more three dimensional with that. Yeah, it's just I love I love what's going on here, but I will admit I know very little of the history here. I, know <laughs> I can give a bit of a background edited. if you want. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a resurgent point in the empire, I think. But beyond that, take it away. This is actually a great example. I, I've never seen one with a beard on Basil. I don't know if that's a rarity or if it's just so nice of a strike that that's preserved. But yeah, Basil II, he's kind of seen as maybe the Trajan of the Byzantine Empire. He controlled Byzantium at its peak territorially and influence-wise. I think he ruled like nine 970s to about 1020. But he's most famous for his wars against the Bulgars. He's known as Basil Bulgaratonos or Basil the Bulgar Slayer. And that comes from a battle where he took 10,000 prisoners and he blinded, took out both eyes of 99 out of every 100 prisoners and the 100th person he took one eye out. So the one with the one eye left could get the 99 blind back home. And apparently after doing this, the Bulgar Khan was so shocked that he fainted and died on the spot. But you can notice here in the coin, Basil was on the left. Uh, he's the senior emperor. If you notice, his hand is actually above his junior brother, Emperor Constantine VIII. And Basil was sort of known as a strict yet competent emperor. Constantine was more the party boy. Uh, he never really got access to power. Basil sort of kept him secluded, and once he took the throne for his own after Basil died, he's sort of seen as an incompetent emperor, but um, not the worst. But yeah, this is a very interesting issue, sort of encapsulating, I guess you could say, the peak of the Byzantine Empire when they had most of their success. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. I guess I wanted something that represented Byzantium, but I'm not too huge on trachies, I'm sorry. And I just, yeah, I fell in love with both sides of this. It's just amazing to me. Yeah, this really is one of the best I've seen. I quite like it. You can really tell the visual difference, too, just between Basil and Constantine. You can sort of from this tell, oh, like Basil is bearded a little bit taller, his hands above Constantine. You can tell who's senior and who's junior. And Basil. Yeah, one uh, of them's a man and one is a boy. <laughs> yeah, fairly. even though that, that wasn't the case in real life on the coin. It's the way they're going to show it. So yeah, very cool. Perception politics. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I guess that's going to conclude our episode. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And as always, I'd like to thank you guys for coming on. We've got to see some awesome coins here from the early Roman Republic to Greek coins to Byzantine. I think we had a, a very good variety this time. A blast. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, I hope you, you all enjoy your weekend, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace.